Here we go. <clears throat> well, good. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we are here for the uh, for the um, be a be a garden scene investigator workshop. Okay, if you can please bear with us for a quick second. Here we go. And with that said, um, so a little bit of webinar housekeeping. Uh, please keep your microphones muted. Um, submit questions via the chat. Um, uh, we're going to be um, having a Q&A session, of course, towards the end. Uh, but if we don't get to your questions, just go ahead and keep submitting them through the chat. And we'll make sure to address them um, after the workshop is over. We're going to be um, addressing all those questions. Um, the, the handout, the presentation hand and some handout information will be sent over to everybody. Um, we are we are going to be hopefully posting the presentation on our website. We still need to get uh, uh, ask permission for for doing so, but hopefully we'll be on our website. Um, my name is Juan Garcia. I'm with the IRWD with the Irvine Ranch Water District. I'm the Senior Water Efficiency Landscape Specialist with the district. Um, if you have any questions, we do have a hotline number just in case you need to talk to any staff if something's going on, um, which is listed right there on the screen, 949-453-5656. Um, if you need, if you need a, uh, have any further questions, you can always email me at askjuan at irwd.com. I'm going to make sure I put this into the chat so everybody does have access to it. Uh, but uh, here we go. This workshop, go ahead, uh, go to the next slide, please, Linda. So this workshop is being presented by the UCCE Master Gardeners of Orange County. We have a fantastic presenter, Linda Hennies, um, has been a UCC Master Gardener since 2012 and has been a speaker at many garden clubs throughout Orange County. Uh, Linda has led, Linda is the lead of the Orange County Master Gardeners hotline and helps and maintain, helps maintain the website. Her main interests are drought tolerant landscaping and vegetable gardening. Uh, throughout the presentation, I am going to be um, putting some links in the chat feature just so you guys can follow. But uh, here we go. Linda, thank you so much for uh, being here for us. And uh, we always look forward to you presenting at these. Thank workshops. you, Juan. Actually, my name is Linda Guinness. It's Guinness, Lithuanian, yes, sorry. not in Spanish. Yeah, Guinness. <laughs> so here we go. Um, the reason we decided to put on this program is uh, a few of us who work on the hotline were trying to recruit more master gardeners, and they thought it was some big mysterious thing to be able to answer gardening questions that we must have some special talents or training. And we said, no, it's really not that hard. There's a lot of steps that anyone could follow. And so we put together this presentation to show uh, the general public about how to be more observant in your garden. And we know that uh, a lot of these detective shows are very popular on TV. They have been for years. And so we're going to look at all the techniques they use, the great detectives like uh, Sherlock Holmes and Columbo and Father Brown and see what do they do that makes them stand out, makes them great detectives. And it's usually uh, just powers of observation. Plus, they know a lot of trivia. So we'll get into a little bit of uh, garden trivia, too, to supplement your powers of observation. So what we're going to be uh, learning today is how to be really thorough in your observations, how to look at your garden, where to look, what to look for, and then how to use your observations to help you search the internet because you know there's a lot of information out there there's a lot of what in politics is called fake news but in gardening we just call it you know misinformation uh, it's not true that you could solve every gardening problem with dawn dishwashing soap and epsom salts so, uh, and sometimes it's even easier than that uh, we'll talk about where what resources can be trusted uh, you know, not just random things on Pinterest, but where to look uh, for scholarly sites and places that have actually done research. And when you need more help, well, what to do? Because we don't want to put the hotline out of business. We're still there for your questions. And hopefully this will just help you to uh, gather a little more information when you do contact us with a question. And that picture 
is taken from my own garden. So you can see I'm not the perfect gardener. I do get insects sometimes, but now I know what they are and what to do about them. Can we know <clears throat> when we watch uh, those TV shows and all those different CSI programs, the first thing that the detective always tries to do is identify the victim. Because if you identify the victim, then that helps narrow down your suspect list. And it works the same with plants. Uh, knowing what your plant is also helps you know how to take care of it because you can look up, you know, how much water does it need, how much sun does it need, when does it need fertilizer. And also sometimes just to satisfy your curiosity, if you see a plant uh, you like, you might want to identify it so you can go to the nursery and buy the same thing for yourself. So we'll uh, see an example of how knowing the identity of a plant really helps narrow down what problems might be. That picture is also from my front yard. It's part of my drought tolerant landscape. So uh, I've been doing what Juan's been preaching. Okay, this shows you just an example of the difference between a rose and a sage plant, all the different kinds of pests and problems you might have. The list of problems for a rose is huge. There's a whole bunch of different invertebrates, which are insects and other things without backbones, and uh, all different kinds of diseases a rose plant can get. And then look at the list is very short. On sage, there's only two different kinds of pests that a sage might have, only three diseases, and they're all different kinds of fungus and mold. And then the environmental disorders are pretty much the same on most plants. Too much water, not enough water, not enough minerals, too much minerals. So it shows you the big difference. Once you know what your plant, the name of your plant, it makes it a lot easier to figure out what's wrong with it. If you don't know the name of your plant, we can help you out with that too. Sometimes you might have moved into a new house and uh, moved into a house owned by someone else and you don't know what the plants are that the other person put in. The other thing we can do is um, if once we're ident trying to identify the victim, is also examine the victim. And this uh, shows you what you might look for. Now, these are holes, but the holes aren't all the same. You can see the hole in the first picture is right in the middle of the leaf, and it's kind of irregular. You can see a little brownish on the edges. This one, even more irregular. You can see there's some extra evidence here. It looks like some kind of animal poop. And this uh, hole here is really nicely cut off, very circular in shape. And these are all made by different kinds of pests. So knowing, uh, looking at the hole real closely will help you too. And if you want to have us identify the pest, taking a picture of the hole will help too, because we love to um, have pictures. Really helps a lot more than just a description. But you could see the holes are caused by pets with chewing mouth parts. You can see a slug made this holes. Slugs don't actually have, slugs are insects, so they don't have chewing mouth parts, but slugs and snails have raspy tongues. So if you're going to look at the hole with a magnifying glass, you would see the edges would be a little more raggedy than if the hole was chewed off with something that has clean mouth parts. This slug and snail is kind of, um, has a very rough tongue that's just rasping off the edges. This is a caterpillar. Caterpillar does have chewing mouth parts and they bite holes in all kinds of things. Caterpillars, as we know, are only one part of the life cycle of an insect. This little caterpillar is going to grow up to be a moth or a butterfly. So if we want to protect our plants from caterpillars, you might use netting or something to keep the butterflies from laying their eggs on your plant. Once they get this big, you can also pick them off. Or if you have uh, birds in your yard, make your yard bird friendly, the birds will do a lot of this work for you so you are not overrun with caterpillars. This third little critter down here is a leaf cutter bee, and that's the insect that made the hole, those neat holes in the rose petals. They don't eat those leaves, but they use the little pieces of leaves to uh, make their nests. So there's a little piece of handy trivia for you right now that insects can have only two different kinds of mouth parts. They either chew holes or they suck on things, but they don't do both. So caterpillars, when they're in this stage, they have chewing mouth parts, 
But once they go through metamorphosis and become a moth or butterfly, they have sucking mouth parts. So when people say moths are chewing holes in their clothes, it's not really the moths that are chewing those holes. It's their little babies, the caterpillars, that are chewing the holes. More clues we could look for in your garden are like the tracks. Uh, insects don't leave actual footprints too much, but if you have sli uh, slugs or snails in your garden, they do leave slime trails. And you can see that in your yard. And I think that's a picture I took at, uh, at my house. You have to have just the right light to see it well, but um, to photograph it well. But to see it, they're, they're pretty obvious uh, if you're looking for slime. These are droppings. Those are the droppings of a tomato um, hornworm. They're pretty big for a caterpillar, but hornworms are pretty big caterpillars. So you might see that. Sometimes that's the first sign that you have tomato hornworms because they blend in with the uh, their surroundings. They're the same color as the leaves, but the droppings do stand out. So if you see that, look up above and you might find the caterpillar. Another uh, thing that insects do, which enables them to look so long, is they don't sit on the top of the leaf where we can see them easily. Uh, they're not that obvious, just like uh, Someone committing a crime doesn't just stand out on the sidewalk with their burglary tools and their mask on where anyone can see them. They sneak around. So here's uh, an example of in the lower right corner, you can see there's a caterpillar here. You can barely see it because the caterpillar is the same color as the surroundings, and they do all their chewing on the underside of the leaf. So when you're standing in your garden, you're seeing most of the leaves from above. And you might think, oh, what are those holes from? I don't see any pests. Well, pick up the leaf and look on the other side, and you might find your pest right there. And then that gives you the opportunity to pick it off or squish it or you know, feed it to your chickens. Another clue uh, we can find is when you look at the leaves. Now, these leaves don't have holes, but they have tiny little dots. And the stippling, this is caused by insects that have those sucking mouth parts. So they're not making holes in the leaves, but they're sucking the juices out of the plant leaves, which damages the cells and leaves these tiny little dots. Now, this is pretty infested here because there's like almost more dots than there is green leaf here. That's a tomato leaf. That's not, I don't think that's from my garden. Mine don't get that bad, I hope. Um, these are some other leaf pictures I've collected from the internet. So these are called caused by insects with sucking mouth parts. And the main culprits are thrips, white flies, aphids, scale, and mealybugs. And the one that made all those little dots is a spider mite. So thrips are really, really tiny, um, hard to see without a loop. White flies are more obvious, and also they fly around if you hose them off. And aphids also, aphids come in a lot of different colors, not just green. You might see gold aphids on your milkweed, you see black aphids on onions. They're very common pests. Uh, white flies and aphids are pretty easy to hose off. You can just you see this leaf. It's really covered with uh, probably woolly aphids, and then the leaf turns black. Um, parts got black. These, all these sucking insects are sucking the plant juices out, and they're a little bit sloppy eaters. So when they're sucking those juices out, some of the honeydew that they're sucking out of these plants stays on the leaf, and it makes the leaf sticky and moist, which creates a perfect environment for the growth of this uh, soot, what we call sooty black mold. Sometimes you can't tell whether uh, you got a white fly or a mealy bug, because some of the white, there's woolly white flies, which are kind of fuzzy, and mealy bugs are kind of fuzzy. But the treatment is the same for either one, so you don't really have to be very precise in knowing whether you've got aphids or mealybugs. You can hose them off or use insecticidal soap if you have a really bad case. Scale is a little more tricky. Scale is like the barnacles of the plant world. They have a hard outer coating, so you can't really spray anything on them that's going to do any good. At one stage in their life cycle, the little nymphs will crawl out from under this to go to a new place on the plant, which is how they end up spreading and increasing. So your spray would have to be timed really well to when the nymphs were active, uh, which is pretty hard to do. What I find is easier is you could usually scrape these off with a stick, like a popsicle stick, or maybe a stick laying on the ground or branch from the plant, 
And if you do a pretty good job of scraping if, uh, and also catch them before the infestation gets this bad, uh, you can keep scale more in hand. Uh, one thing you might uh, notice, even before you find those bugs, is you might see a lot of ants crawling into your plant. And I think, why are ants crawling up my orange tree? Or why are ants going in that shrub? Because the ants aren't eating the plant itself. The ants like all that honeydew we talked about that these uh, sloppy eaters are leaving all over the plant, the aphids and the scale and the mealy bugs. So the ants come up there and they love that honeydew. And they will actually protect those insects. Uh, will keep away the ladybugs and the other natural enemies from those uh, pests that exude the honeydew. So one good thing to do if you're having a problem, uh, you're seeing ants crawling up your plants, is to get rid of the ants. And if you can get rid of the ants, the other natural predators can help take care of the aphids and the mealybugs and other pests that you have. So the, if the ants are there to protect them, uh, that's a really important thing to take care of. And you can do that by uh, making a barrier so the ants can't go up your tree. Uh, there's, uh, we have some information. There's a product called Tanglefoot that you apply around the trunk, not directly on the trunk, but a piece of cloth or something around the trunk that is uh, so sticky that the ants will get stuck and they can't crawl up the plant. Or you could uh, make a solution. We, can, uh, we have information on that in our pest notes, a solution with boric acid and water and a little bit of sugar to attract them. And that could uh, kill the ants. The most effective uh, poisons, of course, are the ones that don't kill the ants immediately, but they take back to their nest and then they can kill all the other ants there. So this is a picture of Tanglefoot. Um, we usually don't uh, mention products by name, but there's not a lot of options out there. Tanglefoot is the one. You can see they have some uh, papery substance around the tree, and they're getting ready to apply it. Uh, don't apply it with your bare hands like that, or you'll end up stuck to the tree or stuck to the container. It's like sort of like super glue that never sets. So glove up if you're going to use that. There's a picture of the ant taking care of the little aphids because uh, they're getting that honeydew for the ant. The ant has chewing mouth parts, not sucking mouth parts. So the aphids there, because they could suck it out, are really helping the ant. This is a sign of spider mites. Uh, there's webbing all over the plant. We got a message one time in our hotline where someone said, I went on vacation for a couple of weeks and came back to this, and it looked like someone had put quilt batting all over their tomato plants. And they had like 20 of them, a whole bunch of tomato plants. And it was a situation like this is really too far gone to remedy. Uh, spider mites reproduce mainly in hot, dry weather, so you won't see them too much this time of year. So it's important to check your garden frequently. And at the first sign that you're starting to get spider mites, uh, use some neem oil, cut off the worst branches, and bag them up and get them into the trash. And don't compost or recycling, recycle anything like this because uh, you're just spreading them more in the environment. Also, one problem with uh, if you have spider mites, it might be because, be because someone near you is spraying really heavy-duty insecticides and killing all the beneficial insects. Spider mites, unfortunately, will bounce back from spray a lot faster than the ladybugs and lacewings and our other beneficial insects. So using very broad spectrum and uh, insecticides like seven that kills almost everything doesn't quite get rid of the spider mites. And it just gives them an opportunity to reproduce more. So it's important um, with integrated pest management, we believe in always using starting step by step and always taking steps that will be least impactful to the environment. Trails are another clue. You can see if you see trails like that, that means that leaf miners are in the leaf. And we have, a lot of us have heard of citrus leaf miners, but there's other kind too besides citrus leaf miners. And go in lettuce and other different plants. And by the time you see that, it might already be gone. Like many other insects, the leaf miner goes through different stages in its life cycle. So it doesn't stay in that little uh, leaf miner's uh, stage where it's crawling around in between those cells of the plant. It actually is a flying insect. The eggs are laid on, like most eggs, on the back of the leaf, the underside of the leaf. For citrus leaf miners, the little um, pest only lays one egg, usually right at the midrib. 
uh, per leaf. Uh, it was one time I did actually was able to find an egg on a lemon tree leaf, but they're just not something you would notice. By the time you see this, the damage is done. The leaf miner crawls out of the hole, uh, makes a little cocoon, and then it turns into a little flying creature and goes away. This usually is just cosmetic damage. Um, you can cut that off and throw it away. Or if you don't, uh, if your plant's pretty small, leave it on there because all that green part of the leaf still has chlorophyll in it and is still making food for the plant. If you think it's ugly, though, you could remove it. Um, Sometimes if the miner's still in there and you could figure out where it is, you could just squish it in there. But that, again, is pretty hard to determine. Uh, the only, if you have these in your citrus, you think there's too many, you can get a pheromone trap. In the citrus orchards, they put the pheromone traps in the trees so they can monitor the level of activity and to see how big the problem is. We don't want to do that in our home garden because you're just attracting the leaf miners into the tree. In your home garden, you're using the trap to actually catch the leaf miners. So you would want to put it far away from your citrus tree so you're not actually causing them to go into your citrus uh, leaves. But usually this is, a, is not a serious problem. It's something you could just ignore and say, well, you know, plants aren't perfect. It's not going to look like the greenhouse plant you get that's, you know, in a hermetically sealed environment. The guys are wearing those hazmat suits to take care of them. Once you get plants out into the natural environment, you are going to see some insect damage. And part of integrated pest management is determining what your threshold is for how much damage you uh, is tolerable and how much indicates a problem you need to take care of. Another thing that could cause damage is herbicide damage, and it's called Roundup damage. If you're spraying, uh, trying to get rid of weeds close to regular plants, very tiny bits of the aerosolized spray can end up drifting on the wind or a breeze, and it will cause damage to your plants on roses especially. It can cause the um, new growth to be all twisted and mangled. and looks like the rose has some kind of disease. The plant will outgrow it eventually, but that part that's damaged is going to get better. So you can like, just cut this off. That's not going to suddenly magically turn green again. This is showing herbicide damage on another plant too. So if you are going to use something to, uh, you need to kill something, you could apply it with a brush or don't do it when it's windy. Be very careful with that because drift can damage other plants. Now besides uh, creepy crawly things, there's also fungi that can cause problem in mold. The first one you see uh, is, this is really common, this is rust. And that's not my plant. You see, these are from our IPM website. These are some, um, I haven't had rust that bad for several years. There's uh, fungicides you could spray on that are organic that uh, take care of the problem pretty well. And also, um, it's your cultural habits for your plant. Like, uh, by we mean the culture of the plant is how you're watering and sunlight and making sure it has good air circulation keeping the old, like if leaves like this fell on the ground, you would remove them because there's spores there that could keep spreading to other plants. This is powdery mildew, another really common one. Uh, a lot of these spores are always present in the air, so we can't have a, a spec to completely avoid them ever. This is a little bit of the sooty black mold. You see it's the mold that grows from the honeydew. So if you see this, on your fruit, you know that you probably have some aphids or other sucking insects that are producing honeydew. This can be just washed off the orange. It's on, just on the peel. It doesn't affect the fruit. It's not poisonous to us. It's just not pretty. The oranges that you buy in the store look pretty because they either they do wash them off and then they go through processing plant. Anything that doesn't look perfect, they'll cast aside and maybe use it for marmalade or some other kind of orange product orange oil furniture polish or something. So don't expect every orange in your tree to look like the one that's on display in the grocery store. These things are harmless. They look kind of gross, but they won't really um, harm your plant. These are fungi, and uh, this fungi grows on decaying things. So if you put a uh, mulch out, it's really common to find this. It's called dog vomit fungus. It's actually a slime mold, not a fungus. It comes in lots of different colors, so it's uh, quite variable. And it doesn't mean there's something wrong with your compost or there's something you 
the manufactured was bad. It's just this fungus is the spores are present everywhere, and if you put out your mulch and it's damp and the conditions are just right, this will grow and it'll dry up. You could scrape it off if you think it's too ugly, or if you wait a few days, it'll just dry it by itself. And it's not poisonous. These really cool looking ones are called bird nest fungus. They look like little cups with bird eggs in them, but this is also a fungus that grows on decaying plant material, uh, like mulch. I had this, once I had a few in my garden. Uh, you can't tell from the picture, but they're very, very tiny. The little cups are probably three quarters of an inch across. Uh, it's kind of fun to look at. And then also, you know, once it's drier, they'll dry up and go away. This fungus is a little more serious because since fungus is growing on decaying plant material, you don't want to see fungus growing on the trunk of a tree that's supposed to be alive. This fungus here means that you've got dead wood here where there should be living wood. So there's something wrong going on with that tree. You might need to cut off that whole branch. Discoloration is another clue that, of something wrong with your plant. This discoloration, you can see all the veins standing out. That's a nutritional deficiency. You usually need to get more fertilizer on your plant. This could be uh, iron deficiency. Um, this is another deficiency. This looks like a citrus leaf. Sometimes the citrus leaves will be more yellow in cold weather, and that doesn't mean that there's not nutrients in the soil, but in really cold weather, the citrus trees can't pull that nutrient out of the soil as well. If you saw this in the summer, then you think, wow, I really need to fertilize because the leaves shouldn't look like this in the summer. But if it's been, you know, like 40 degrees outside and you see this, well, that's part of the normal life cycle and the, the nutrition's there, but the roots just aren't pulling it out because it's too cold. Then we can look at the trunks or the stems of your plants. You can look for holes. There's little holes in this tree. They could be caused by different kinds of beetles. Uh, some of them, the beetles, the Plophysicus shot hole borer, which is pretty common in Orange County. They make holes in the trunks of sycamores, box elders, and a lot of other trees. They have like 40 or 50 different host trees that they'll go on. They're not very fussy. And then they live in there, and the a bad thing they do is they're not eating the tree, but they bring uh, fungus spores with them, or fusarium with them, and then the fusarium gets into the vascular system of the plant and kills it. So there have been a lot of trees taken down in Orange County because of that. If you have little holes, um, you could take a picture of that and send it to us, and we could tell by the size of the hole uh, what it might be. One way we could tell if it was a shot hole bore is we put a ballpoint pen next to the hole. And if the hole was the same size as the pen, then it was a pretty good chance it was the shot hole bore. This fungus we just talked about, that means that tree is dead because that fungus wouldn't be growing on living tissue. And these little things you recognize from the other picture, that scale. There's uh, many different kinds of scale. There's armored scales or soft scale. On um, succulents, uh, a lot of succulents get scale. In fact, uh, there's a red scale called cochineal scale that grows on the, um, the opuntia. And that was used for red dye for hundreds of years. Uh, in fact, the, when the Spaniards first came, to, uh, were in Mexico and they found this scale growing on and found that it was, it, uh, they can get red dye from it. They were plans to have whole big uh, farms of opuntia cactus where they could grow this red scale for the cochineal. Uh, get the cochineal scale and use it for dyes. Lawn problems are a little different. Lawns don't have very big leaves for us to look at, but we can look at the spots and kind of figure out by the spot what caused it. Now, these spots are really round. Most of the grass around it looks okay, and that means your dog or your neighbor's dog or someone's pet has decided that's the bathroom spot for them. And there's nothing much to do except, you know, water it and wait for it to green back up. But if you have like a spot like this and everything around looks okay, some animal has done that. We were having an open house at South Coast Rec that's not too far from IRWD. And there was a brown spot on our nicely manicured lawn right before our open house. And they had uh, people who were doing pest studies had put out some motion activated night cameras. And we found the reason there was a spot on our beautiful lawn was a skunk decided to go to the bathroom there. 
All right, the night before our uh, open house. So it could be some other animals, not just your dog. The scrape marks sometimes, especially on slopes, are just caused by the lawnmower hitting parts of the grass uh, too low. And you could see the, uh, some parts where the soil might be higher and the mower is just taken off too much. It's not a disease. This is, looks more like a fungus. It's patchy. There's nice green parts, and then there's parts that are all brown and ugly, but it's very irregular. It also is dug up in some parts. You can see maybe there is, uh, there could be a irrigation leak, too much moisture there. There could be grubs in the soil, and skunks or other animals are digging up those grubs and ripping up the lawn. So this is a little different problem. So you could see that by really examining the problem a little closer, not all brown spots on lawns are the same. And that'll help you figure out what the problem is, or help you uh, get a picture, or when you send it to us to figure out what the problem is. Now, crime scene tools. We know that when they go to the um, crime scene, all those investigators have their little box of things, and they're taking fingerprints and DNA samples. Our tools are way simpler than that. Uh, moisture meter. This is a really a great tool, you could tell if the problem is that your plant is too wet or too dry. When we first started our master gardener training, one of our instructors, Dr. John Kabashima, was telling us that 85% of plant problems are one of four things, too wet, too dry, too much sun, or not enough sun. So those are the real basics that we always check first. Um, the great thing about a moisture meter, they're only around $10 or less. This one is probably 30 years old. They don't even need batteries. They work by, um, they have different metals in there. And somehow how the metals react will uh, gives you this reading. So once you buy it, you're all set. You don't have to keep replacing batteries or plugging it in or recharging it or anything. Don't leave it in the ground, though. It's meant to be stuck in the ground and then taken out and stored somewhere dry. If you leave it in the ground all the time, I don't know if it would uh, work that way. Another thing is a magnifying glass or a loop. A loop is you know, like what a jeweler uses. For the sake of the picture, I held this by the leaf, but we were told that um, if you use it that way, the entomologist will laugh at you. You're supposed to hold the loop up to your eye and then move the object you're looking at you know, into focus. But a loop will really help you uh, see closer. You might even see the insect that you thought wasn't there when you look at it with a loop. And one thing that's helped me too is, um, even though I might think I'm doing a good job looking, sometimes if I take a picture of a plant, when I go home, get back in the house, and I download the picture and put it on my computer screen, I see things that I didn't see when I was looking at, at it outside. One time I saw, oh my goodness, there was a caterpillar right there and I didn't even notice it when I was in the yard. Yet when I took a picture and looked at it on, the big, uh, on my monitor, it was very obvious to me. So that's a good way to um, get more information to you. Then we look at the scene of the crime. We looked at the victim. We um, looked at all kinds of things about the victim. And now we're going to look at the area around the victim. When we look at the soil, you can see that soil looks pretty dry there. I don't see any uh, irrigation lines, sprinkler heads, or anything in that area. Look at the sun exposure. There's no shadows in that picture. So I don't know if it was just a cloudy day or if maybe that plant is planted in the shade. Uh, we look for irrigation. Uh, if it's plants on a slope, too, you know, if water runs downhill. So sometimes things at the top of a slope are drying out more, and the things at the bottom of the slope are getting soaked. Uh, environmental factors, too, if it's been raining a lot or not raining a lot, uh, the timing of rain. Uh, whether it's you know rained in the summer or we've had so many days of rain in a row that the um, soil isn't absorbing the water anymore. Temperature too, sometimes that you know things can be this summer. And we had a few days this past summer when the temperatures got you know re we had record heat, over 100 degrees, and a lot of plants maybe that had been doing fine for several years had suddenly shown signs of sunburn. They were uh, you know it was just something out of the ordinary that we couldn't really do anything. About. And also, uh, we know one of our mottos is the right plant in the right place. And sometimes a plant's just in the wrong place, and that's why it doesn't thrive. <laughs> and as much as we like mulch, sometimes there is a thing that's too much mulch. 
in this picture, the person had the mulch spread. You know, it's a great idea. They have this mulch, but it's right up to the trunk of the tree. When you're using mulch, you always need to leave space a few inches of bare dirt around that trunk. Otherwise, you've got the mulch right up there. You can end up with rotten tree trunks. You can get crown rot. So leave bare dirt a few inches around every plant, and especially these agaves. Uh, it's a little odd to have bark mulch under agave since they're desert plants. Usually pebbles or rock mulch is more appropriate under succulents. And there's water problems. Uh, if your irrigation system comes on when you're asleep, you might not even know that you have irrigation problems. So we usually advise you uh, once a month or so, turn on the irrigation while you're awake and walk around and see uh, what's happening. You know, my neighbors, uh, they're not only watering their lawn, they're watering the car, whoever parked in front of their house, they're watering the street, they're watering the sidewalk. And of course, by the time they get up a couple hours later, everything is, it's still damp, but they don't actually see what the problem is. Uh, this problem we uh, could see when someone sends us a picture like this. Uh, sometimes you think, oh, when we water, there's the plant, and we need to put the water right where the plant is. Well, we're not watering the trunk. Plant roots go out at least as far as their branches do above the ground. So if you see the leaves all the way out, branches are sticking out past the edges of the picture, the water should be out in a circle around that distance around the plant, because that's where all those roots are that soak up the water. Putting the sprinkler right at the base is also just like putting mulch right up to the base of the tree can cause root rot. So we want to make sure the water is out. And this, of course, you could have not enough water. This grass here might not have any fungus or problems. It's just too dry and thirsty. And that's where a moisture meter would help. You might think uh, maybe your sprinklers are coming on and one of the lines isn't functioning or your timer's not working or uh, a line got broken and part of your lawn might be just thirsty. And plants also need the right amount of sunlight. And sometimes it might be because, you know, things have been going on great for a few years, but there's suddenly a change of environment. And this picture shows people are having a tree taken out. So all this area here, which probably was very shaded, is suddenly going to be in full sun. So these plants that were having a great time in the shade might just suddenly dry up or get you know, brown leaves because this trunk is being removed. And if they remove this other trunk there, uh, tree two, that makes a big change in the environment. And sometimes it's not even your own tree. It could be uh, if you had a neighbor's tree with shading part of your yard and then they take the tree out, suddenly you've got a sunny area that used to be a shady area. So you might need to make some changes in your landscaping. And that also could be a clue, you know, if you're thinking, oh, this plant always did so well. Why does it suddenly look, you know, bad right now? Think about if has anything changed in the environment, whether it be uh, tree removal or other plants being put in, or maybe something grew bigger and bigger and is shading, creating shady area that used to be a sunny area. Shadows change at different times of year too, and. This is like my very first vegetable garden I put in. It was even before I became a master gardener. I got a book called uh, Square Foot Gardening. I would go to different nurseries on Saturday mornings and hear these uh, talks. It sounded really interesting. So I thought, oh, I'll do that. I put together this raised bed. And you could see it was very successful. I had all these plants there. I had melons, and tomatoes, green beans, there's sunflower in there, zucchini, and okra, and all kinds of stuff. Well, I put this garden in in the summer. You, the shadow was way back here by the edge of the sidewalk. And after you know, I got all my summer crops, I thought, oh, great. I'm going to do some. I went to another class and found out about cool season vegetables. And I'll put those in my box. And I get ready to start in September. And after a week or so, the, sh the shadow of the house was all the way over here, completely shading my vegetable box. And of course, by the time we got to the winter solstice, the shadow was all the way up to the block wall fence. So that was not a place I was going to be very successful in growing cool season vegetables. If you don't really pay attention to the shadows, uh, like I wasn't, uh, I didn't realize what a 
great big difference there was between where it was in the summer and where it would be in the winter. The shadows, uh, the sun is coming from a different position. It's much more southerly, and the solar shadows are going, going over to the north. And that's another little tip. That's why when you put your vegetable garden in, always put your taller things to the north so they don't shade the other plants. This shows uh, Santa Ana Zoo Garden. It was another project we had that I was working on. You could see in July, in the morning, there's a jacaranda tree right next to the vegetable garden. And it was shading a lot of this. And some of the vegetables in this area weren't growing quite as well as they could have been. But and the, then we did a lot of uh, renovation, as you can see here. This is October. In the afternoon, you can see all these uh, areas are getting a lot more sun because the shadow has shifted over to another direction. So time of day and season makes a lot of difference in your how much sun your plants are getting. The morning sun is not as intense as the afternoon sun, so there are some plants that will do okay uh, facing east and getting the morning sun, but if they're uh, getting the western sun in the afternoon, might be a little more prone to getting crispy leaves. Another thing we could think of when we're trying to figure out what the problems are in the garden is what has the weather been like lately? And that's something we have no control over, but it can help us understand what's going on. This was probably, when, it was not 100 years ago, it was only a couple years ago when it used to rain in Orange County. Um, and suddenly, you know, we can get a lot of uh, water there, which is great for our plants. And it could really make a difference, especially weeds. You might notice after a rain, uh, we get a lot of more weeds sprouting up. And it also then means we don't have to have our irrigation going. Our plants can survive uh, with a rainfall. If there's too much, though, some plants can get soggy, plants that aren't used to that. Uh, or a plant that's in a low space where the water doesn't drain well, especially some succulents, might drown. I had some uh, more drought-tolerant plants, and one was happened to be in a low spot where the water wasn't draining off very well, and it did uh, not do well with that. It was just too moist. Temperatures, we mentioned before, when it gets to be like 100 degrees out here, plants our plants are used to more mild temperature, and we could see some damage from that. Santa Ana winds, too. If your fruit tree only has uh, fruit on one side, it could be that the Santa Ana wind came up right when those blossoms were starting and blew all the blossoms off one side or blew all the small fruit. I know I've seen a lot of damage to my orange tree on the northern side when we had Santa Ana winds come and there were dried up leaves and all brown and I didn't get oranges in that part. Uh, so that's not something we could control, but if we understand that when we know, oh, well, it was the Santa Ana wind and I really can't do too much about that and maybe just do some pruning. If we know ahead of time, we have a Santa Ana wind expected, one good thing we could do is water our plants before the wind comes and dries them out. Uh, it's better if we water the plants ahead of time, they'll be better able to withstand that. It's a lot better to do that than to wait till after the wind and then try to revive them with water because sometimes it's too late. Well, we don't get this very often here in Orange County, but hail uh, does come once in a while and it was like, Oh, cool, there's hail. I'm going to take some pictures of the hail. And then a day or two later, these uh, these are epidendrums. They had little dots all over the leaves and other succulents, too. As I walked my neighborhood, I could see where a lot of uh, more warm weather plants have been damaged by the little hail hitting the leaves. So if you see uh, little odd dents or divots, funny marks on your succulent leaves, uh, if it hailed a day or two before, that's probably your culprit. It's not a disease. And these are called abiotic problems because they're not caused by anything biological. They're not caused by any kind of pest or insect or disease. They're just caused by the environment. Now I'll go step by step with an example here. This is first we're identifying the victim. This is a Carolina cherry. It's a very common uh, shrub that we use in landscaping here. And we have a botanical name, too. The reason why we like to look at botanical names is sometimes there's multiple plants that have the same kind of common name. Now, Carolina cherry pretty much is just one plant. But there are other things like mock orange. There's probably six different plants that are called mock orange, and they're all completely different plants. 
So if you know the botanical name or you can look it up, that really will help figure out what the disease is. So another thing we, we observed that this plant, this uh, Catalina cherry, is the only Carolina cherry is the only plant in the garden that has that problem. If you see the same problem on multiple plants in your garden, then it might not be something pest related. It could be something abiotic, like maybe overspray from Roundup. If you know five or six different plants all seem to have the same problem, uh, a lot of pests don't like that many different kinds of plants. If you check, there were no visible insects on that plant. We know it was on drip irrigation. Uh, I had northern exposure only afternoon sun. So that was what we know about that plant. So we go to the our pest index. You don't have to write this all down. It's real easy if you just put in your Google search uh, IPM. That stands for Integrated Pest Management. And then a lot of places have IPM. You put UCANR after that. We'll get you to the, our California index here. UC stands for University of California, and the letters A and R are agricultural natural resources. And it became part of the UC system. I don't know how they organized things, but that's what our state did. So we go to the website, oops, and this is what it looks like. You see UC IPM. If you put that in your uh, Google, you probably could find it that way too. Sometimes I forget whether the UC ANR comes first or the IPM comes first, but if you put it in Google search, you'll still find it. So I'm going to go to the home pests of home, garden, and turf. We don't need to know about agriculture or anything. This is our spot here. And pests in the garden. You can see that on this website, there's a place for household pests. That means if you have pests, your house, pantry moths, or uh, things that are eating your wood, like you know termites or fabric, you know the things that are making holes in your claw. We Hi, Linda, uh, Linda. This is Juan. Yes. Um, it's not coming up. I just the the slide with the extension is still on there. Um, oh. What we could do is after, like, when we start going into the Q and A, I'll, okay. I'll go ahead and pop these up, and um, and then I'll share my screen, and you know we can get them going to different okay. sites. Yeah. But anyway, okay, thanks for letting me know that because I was seeing it on my screen. I didn't know you weren't seeing it on yours. Yeah, it's just the, the whole share screen thing. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, if you go to this website, you will be able to see, uh, find the name of the plant, and then it will give you a whole list of all the different uh, diseases that it could have. This one didn't have too many for that Carolina cherry. And then the nice thing is it doesn't just tell you what the pest is, but it tells you what to do about it. So it tells you how to get rid of the problem. This is another picture we got in on the website, and we thought, oh, uh, you know, the person wanted to know why their leaves look so bad on this uh, citrus tree. And some, one of our eagle eyed uh, people noticed that the grass looked a little unusual there. And close up, we could see it is not real grass. They had uh, astroturf put in, or, you know, artificial lawn put in, and just this one little hole around the trunk left. So, uh, and there's no sign of how they're irrigating or watering this tree. And so we said, you know what? How are you getting fertilizer on this tree? The roots that are soaking up the fertilizer and water are way underneath that artificial grass. And you can't sprinkle the fertilizer granules on the artificial grass and expect it to go through to the tree. So the problem was this artificial turf that they had put in. So their previously healthy tree was looking a little soft. But it was noticing that it was artificial turf and not real grass that really helped. We see this. Um, if you have milkweed, you've seen these bugs because uh, they're milkweed bugs. There's a lot of bugs that are orange and black. So if you just Google orange and black bugs, you'll see a whole series of them. And as a good observer, what you need to do is look at where the spots are. The there's a black on the end. There's kind of a black, like two black dots that are kind of connected. There are box elder bugs that look almost just like these. Um, there's one called the red shoulder bug that looks almost just like this. So knowing the plant that it's on, knowing that this is on milkweed, and then carefully looking at the pattern of the bug will help you understand that this, uh, identify this as a milkweed bug. And then you can see 
in the pest notes what to do about it. Since this isn't considered a serious pest, there's really not too many recommendations. You could hose them off if you want. And I also I found an interesting article that says, even though they do eat, um, they will eat the monarch butterfly eggs, they also eat aphids. So they mostly will just eat the seeds from the milkweed. So if you see these, it's up to you if you want to get rid of them. Uh, if you want to save your milkweed seeds, just hose them off. Uh, if you don't really care too much, they won't go on to, other, on to your other garden and eat all your other plants. So when you are looking, you want to Google something, you have to really look carefully because there's, there are a lot of bugs with the same color. And so if you Google red and black bug, if you Google orange and black bug or red and black bug, I find you will get pretty much the same assortment of pictures. When you do it, if you want to identify your plant, but you don't know what it is, a picture like this isn't going to help too much. This is a tree in front of my house. It doesn't have any leaves on it. It'll just look like a generic tree. You can't really tell. You can tell a few things. It's not a Christmas, not a fir tree. It's not a palm tree. But other than that, it's hard to tell what it is. <clears throat> so if you want to identify something that you're not sure what it is, flowers are really uh, big on the botanist list of identifiers. Flowers are, are more individualistic too than just the um, leaves in the trunk. So this flower with the flies in it, you can see is pretty unusual. It has fuzz on it. And if you were to Google fuzzy flower that attracts flies, uh, it has five petals. That's important to the number of petals. You would find out that's a stapelia. It's, uh, there's different varieties of stapelias. And it's a succulent plant. And it does, in the family of plants, it does have a carrion smell that attracts flies. And that was one from uh, one that I have. It's from my collection. This is a plant that we saw. I was walking with some friends on Balboa Island. We thought, wow, that's pretty. What is that plant? The flowers look kind of like um, hydrangeas, except that they're hanging down. So when I went home, I Googled, you know, hydrangea flowers hanging down, and I found out the name of this tree, which I don't remember off the top of my head right now, but it was a way to, by observing what is it like, uh, what's the habit, the flowers hang down, they don't stick up, it has very large leaves. Clues like that could help you identify what a plant is. It's the shape and the position of the leaves, the color, markings. This is one from my yard that was um, uh, Ircine. Has, uh, you can see it has a red rib there. It has a very definite pattern. This is a type of fern. So looking at things like that could help you identify the plant. <clears throat> Distinctive uh, features on the trunk. This, even though this tree is bare, it's real easy to tell what it is because it has these sharp thorns on the bottom. It's a floss silk tree. Uh, a lot of them planted around Orange County, even though it's not a native plant. I think it's from Africa. It's beautiful uh, purpley flowers on it in the summer. But that it's an easy one because it has a kind of a big round uh, trunk, the color is pretty distinctive, and those thorns, too, are unusual. So if there's something that's really unusual or different, that's what's going to help you identify the plant. Um, this, of course, we know what this is. It's a hibiscus. Sometimes there's a difference in you know, adjectives you use. If you're going to use a Google search for plant, if you put big red flower, you'll find lots of flowers. If I change it to huge red flower, it really narrowed it down a lot, and hibiscus is one of the first pictures that popped up. The one thing about using, uh, just searching for on Google, you'll find a lot of pictures that are mislabeled there. So what you want to do is, after you find something, you think, oh, I think that's a hibiscus. Then you want to also search for hibiscus and see if you get the same picture back. So always verify what you get from doing a Google search. And even if uh, you're using a plant, uh, some apps they have, like um, Plant Snap, I think is one. What you get from that, it's going to give you its best guess, but um, double check after it tells you, identifies that plant. Look up that plant by name and see if you get the same result. For a while, one of those apps was using our hotline as a source of information. So we would get these oddball questions that just had a picture. It would say, what is this plant? And a picture of a plant. And we were getting. Uh, suddenly got a whole volume of those so that were all pretty much the same format. There was no question, no information about where they saw it. 
just what is this plant in the picture? And then we found out it was an app that was advertising. They had people standing by to identify their plants. And I guess if people had the, um, some identification on their app of where their location was, they were sitting next to the Orange County Master Gardeners for identification. So we had a little talk with them and that stopped. We said, if we're gonna answer the question, we wanna answer them directly so they know it's coming from us and not from your app. Um, difficulties with doing that are um, a lot of plants look very similar and uh, Google images sometimes don't include the very unusual plants. They have common plants and sometimes things are mislabeled. Someone will put something on them up on Pinterest and label it incorrectly and then it ends up in Google images. So you can send photos to our hotline. Uh, usually as I saw before, that different parts of the plant are really helpful, the whole plant and all the different parts. Uh, nursery sometimes are helpful. If you have a disease plant, please don't bring a disease plant into a nursery because you could be bringing their germs or pathogens in there. Or if you do, uh, put a plastic bag over it. The county also has identification services too. So if you look up the Orange County Agricultural Commissioner, they have a lab services and then there's instructions there on how you could send in a plant sample. It'll take a few weeks because Orange County no longer has a local uh, pathologist, plant pathologist, I mean, so it's sent up, um, I'm not sure if it's sent up to Sacramento or to Davis, but up north. This shows you the problem sometimes by trying to identify things by Google. We got this picture and someone wanted to know what it was. And the first Google search I got was, of course, that it was grass. And I could tell there's grass in the picture, but I want to know what those little brown things are. So I zoomed in on that, cropped off the grass, and tried the search again. Google image search, and then it said this was wood. Well, no, it's not wood. So that's where some there's some limitations on that. It is a fungus. One of our other master gardeners identified it for us. As far as that unknown tree goes, if you really want to know what it is, you would have to um, look at it different times of year. This is the little panicles that hang down. These are the little seed pods it produces. Um, that's what they look like. The flowers look like in the plant. It does change color. It's deciduous as you could see it was bare in the picture. The flower string color and that's what it looks like. And by using all that different information, I was able to figure out that was a Chinese tallow. And it's no longer on our city list of street trees because they don't use it anymore. It's too messy. Uh, here's some websites that are really, um, will be very useful for you once you gather some information. The more you look at in your garden and get information together ahead of time, the more these resources will be helpful to you. It'll make more sense to you. Um, the number one one for pests, of course, is this IPM website. Easy to find. Uh, if you don't remember it all, IPM, you could even put UC Davis and probably find the same thing. California Garden Web is also part of our services from the UCA and part of UCANR. California Garden Web will give you a lot of information about growing fruit trees, uh, growing vegetables. It's not just pest oriented. It's more like how to care for your uh, plants and uh, what to look for, like how to start a vegetable garden. If you're going to get a tree, this is a really good one. This comes from Cal Poly. It's called Select Tree. It's the word select and tree put together. And you could find trees, uh, especially good if you want to identify a tree, based on all different characteristics. It'll, you know, the size, whether it turns leaves turn color, uh, shape of leaf. Don't put in more than like maybe four, four different categories where you're selecting things because it just can't handle it. If you put 20 different identifiers, it's really too much for it to work with. But it's a very useful website. Also, if you want to know how to take care of a tree. California rare fruit growers, if you're growing things that are different than our regular apples and peaches and plums and you want to grow uh, cherimoyas or mulberries or atamoyas, something like that. California Rare Fruit Growers has a lot of really good information. And then, of course, our local organization, Orange County Master Gardeners, or MG Orange. If you don't remember the rest of it, if you could find us just by putting MG Orange in your web search. And we do have a hotline. There's in, uh, a little link there to send us your questions. So. That's what we're here for. We want to really serve the people of Orange County who are interested in gardening. And we want to really make sure people know about integrated pest management, which means you do the least harm to the environment. So 
a lot of our first strategies will just involve the hose, hose off your plant, uh, and also to take care of it well so we don't have so many problems. Um, we're going to skip that right now because uh, this was an example of an easy Google search. There's a lot fewer blue flowers and yellow flowers, so blue flowers are easy to identify. And this has a really unusual thing. It has really long stamens. So when I put blue flower long stamen, it was easy to identify as the blue glory bower. Someone uh, contacted us about identifying this because they had looked through all their native plant books and couldn't find it. And they saw it on a hike, so they thought it was a native plant. And the reason it wasn't in their native plant books is that it's not a native plant. Seeds might have been scattered by birds, or maybe some person put a cutting there, but it was, even though it was in a wildlife area, it was not a native plant. Oops. Uh, this is uh, another example of how important it is to know the host plant. If we just saw a picture of this caterpillar, we would have no idea what it is, but the person who sent in the picture said, this is on my guava. And as just the word guava narrowed it down so much that we were able to find it was the caterpillar of the guava skipper. And the reason we probably wouldn't have been able to identify it if she hadn't told us it was on a guava is this pest isn't listed on pests that are present in Orange County. It's more common in Mexico, but this person was sending us the question from San Diego, which of course isn't too far from Mexico. So it's indication too that this pest has spread. So knowing the name of the plant is really important in narrowing down what kind of creature is on your plant. This is a real common question we get. What is this brown stuff here? It's not an insect. It's not a disease. It's called blossom end rot. This is one of those abiotic things called by the conditions, growing conditions. And that's, even though it's uh, caused because the cells on the bottom of the plant aren't getting enough calcium and they're collapsing, it's usually not caused because of lack of calcium in the soil. It's usually the water problem. It's because you're watering way too much and then letting the plant dry out. It's not um, being watered evenly enough. And some varieties of tomato are more susceptible to that than others too. So Google, you know, use keywords. You don't have to put and and the and all kinds of things like that. Our big important one is the UCENR website. There's tons of information about pests. There's another good one called Tomato Problem Solver. It's from the University of Florida, I believe, maybe Texas. Uh, they also have universities. An important thing to remember, too, is when you're looking up different plant websites, if there's an EDU at the end of their web address, that means it's an educational institution. And you're getting uh, research-based information, not just um, homemade remedies, things like that. That there's actual, they have an agricultural department that has looked into this. So uh, we don't use just our um, UC uh, resources. Sometimes there are some. Uh, other states might have resources on plants that our, our state hasn't done as much work on, especially ornamental plants. Uh, our UC system, of course, the land-grant universities, they're more uh, interested in uh, keeping up our agriculture in our uh, state because we grow so much food here. So there's a little more heavy interest in that than ornamental plants. Um, Arizona has some good information on succulents. Um, and the tomato problem solver is a really good one. It's nice because they don't have information that we don't have, but they have it presented in a way with a lot of pictures. So it's easy to find just by looking at pictures instead of a lot of words. And then there's a plant problem diagnostic tool that's part of our IPM website too, which um, it gets to the same information from a different direction. You put in the name of the plant and then the part of the plant that's affected, like is the leaf, the stem, or the fruit. And then it keeps narrowing it down, and then it comes at the end, and it'll narrow down the pests for you. So the plant problem diagnostic tool you will see at the IPM website. And before I open it up to questions, we want to make sure people know about ACP. The word still needs to get out there. This is a plant disease, even though progress is being uh, made in research. Uh, ACP is the Asian citrus psyllid. That's the uh, little insect that spreads it. And the disease is called HLB, long, long being. And it's spread by a bacteria that that insect spreads. It is just barely uh, getting into the edges of Irvine now. And it's you will see um, discoloration on the leaves. 
but it's not like nutritional uh, discoloration where it's very uniform and you'll see like maybe a yellow leaf with green veins. This is very model looking. You could see one side of the leaf is different than the other side of the leaf. The yellow coloring crosses the vein. Um, it's a, just a, a little different look than nutritional deficiencies. So if you see that's a thing to be aware of with your citrus, there's a website uh, we can refer you to with lots more information about that. So I'd like to open up to questions now if um, Juan's ready for that. Great, thank you, Linda. Okay, everybody. So um, for those of you who are still here, if you if you click on participants and you hover by your name, there should be a little symbol to um, raise your hand. And I'll make sure I'm going to start looking for that, and you can ask them Linda, uh, Linda some questions, and then you can also type them into the chat feature, and I'll make sure um, we'll address that as well. Um, Linda, I believe also in the chat, people have been um, submitting questions to you directly. Um, for those of you who are submitting questions directly to Linda or myself, can you just please uh, maybe copy and paste that into the chat feature for everyone? Um, this is where I'm going to be getting the questions from, and I will be answering this. Um, I'm going to be uh, sending the questions over to Linda and uh, myself and take a look at them and hopefully try to answer them as best as possible. Okay, Linda, so we have a first person. Let's see, RJ Fox. RJ, go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay. Okay, I think they might have left. Okay, you know, I'm just gonna do it. Linda, I'm gonna read some of the, some okay. of the questions. Okay, hi, I'm out. here. Oh, okay, hi. <laughs> Hi, sorry, I couldn't unmute. So I have, um, I had just two quick questions I posted in the chat. One is I have a plant, um, a couple plants, but mainly there's a geranium. Um, and there's little gnats or I don't know if they're little mosquitoes. They look like little gnats that are just buzz around the soil. And I don't know if there's a fungus or probably. something. You have, probably. So is the plant, does that mean I, it's it's ruined or probably should I transfer? It's probably too, uh, too moist. If you let the soil dry out a little bit, they'll probably just go away. They won't, they're called fungus gnats. Okay. Little they won't really do anything bastards. bad to your plant. Okay, thank you. One is I have a little, I, it's a rodent that has buried under our deck. We have a wood slat deck and it cut, came out a few nights and ate my little, I was propagating some lemon geranium, the little baby leaves. It uh -huh. ate my little polka dot plant leaves. It ate, and it, there was a couple succulents that have very juicy, tender, um, you know, little leaves. I don't remember the name. I don't know the the proper names of them, but mm -hmm. it's it's very specific. But it just mowed all of those down, and I don't want to necessarily set a trap. But what do I do to? <laughs> That's all we would recommend is setting the trap. Ah, yeah. uh, okay. Well, thank you then. <laughs> yeah. Um. You could put some kind of uh, um, screening around your plants. Uh, get something with small holes like a window screen or hardware cloth and just make some kind of protective cage around your plants if you don't want to use a trap. Okay, well, thank you very much. And I will send the hotline. I have a bunch of mystery fungus pictures I'll send you. Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you so much. Okay. Um any, let's see, anybody else with hands oh, up? I'm I saw a question just... with uh, birds eating the guavas. Yes, go ahead. You would have that. to use, um, there's bird netting you could buy in the nursery, and that's about the only way to keep the birds off of fruit trees. The um, Putting CDs in doesn't work. They get used to them, uh, silver strips. They get used to almost anything you put in, the birds get used to right away. So uh, putting netting over your um, tree when the fruit is ripe is usually the best way, so the birds can't get to it. Right. Okay, let's see. Any other questions here? Let's, let's see. So some of the questions that came in, let's see. Linda, I'm just going to just start reading some of these off. Okay. Um, do you... Do you do anything for yellow citrus leaves in winter? No, because uh, they're more the plants are more dormant. If it's cold out, 
if we put extra fertilizer in the um, plant roots still wouldn't take it up. So no, winter time they are a little bit yellow. That's pretty normal. When the, um, the ground temperature is more constant than the air temperature, you know, we can have uh, like last night it probably was pretty chilly. I don't know if it was in the 50s or even lower than that. And then it was predicted to be like 80 in the afternoon. So the air temperature fluctuates a whole lot. Soil temperature doesn't fluctuate as much. It's more constant even from year to year. So uh, it, soil temperature is affected more by how many hours of sunlight is uh, the sun shining on that soil, not the air temperature. So in, even if we get a hot day in the winter time, it's, the plant's not suddenly going to take up that fertilizer in that one hot day and then the next day not take it up. So no, don't worry about uh, if the leaves are not totally yellow, but just like a little bit yellower in the uh, winter time. It's just because the ground is cold. When it warms up, they should green up. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. So here's another question. Um, this is from Billy Ricks. It says thank you. I asked the hotline about Rosa Rosette, but didn't get a what to do answer. I have about. Uh, 17 T roses in infected areas with about three roses sick now. Okay, I think I remember that question. I wasn't the one who answered it. Um, about whether it really was rose rosette disease. Um, uh -huh. That might be one of those diseases that there is no uh, cure for. What I'll do is, um, I don't think I could look it up right now, but. Um, there are some yeah. diseases that are incurable, and there's really nothing yeah. you could do. Okay, let's see. Well, there's some good questions here. Why do my avocados leave uh, leaves keep turning rusty, looking around the edges, even though I think I watered enough? Uh, sometimes too much water can look the same as not enough water. Yeah. Uh, I just well, for one second I just looked up rose rosette. It is a virus, and since it's a virus, that means it is there's no cure for it. There's nothing we could put on the plant to, um, that will will take care of the situation. And that's also easily transmitted, uh, right, Linda? Like if you're yes, it is. stuff, yeah. So uh, there's a little a little mite that goes from plant to plant that could spread that, but there, it is since it's a virus, there's not a cure. Sorry. Yes. Oh no. Exactly. Okay. Let's see. Um. Let's see. Did you, citrus trees seem to benefit from iron-rich soil. Lemon trees, especially. I guess that was a comment by, by some. Yeah, um, that sounds very true. Yes. Yeah. That's why there's sometimes. Uh, in fact, there's foliar spray sometimes, like even the summer and spring. If your leaves don't look too good, you can. There's an iron chelate spray that you could spray on as a foliar spray mm -hmm. to help green up your citrus. That they are. They're heavy nitrogen users. That's why if, when you fertilize, um, we don't use the same fertilizer on everything. There's not like 100 different kinds of fertilizer, but there's a few, uh, like there's citrus uh, citrus and avocado, specifically for those two plants that require the same nutritional requirements. So if you're going to feed your citrus plants, get be sure you get citrus and avocado fruit. Okay, that's great. And you could also use um, composted manure, too, which is very heavy in nitrogen. It's good for citrus. Let's see. Can you suggest when is a good time to fertilize plant shrubs and roses in Irvine? Oh, well, different plants, different times of year. Usually uh, this time of year, not too much because a lot of plants are kind of dormant this time of year. Uh, so they don't really need fertilizer. You would, uh, roses now, is this is the time when they're dormant, should be dormant. And uh, when we would do our rose pruning and then we would fertilize the roses when they start to, um, buds start to break on the new growth. And then about three times a year, evenly spread out. So it could be easy to remember is the first day of spring, the first day of summer, and the first day of fall. And that'll spread out your fertilizer those three times. Uh, most other plants, when they start to bud out in the springs, when you fertilize them, your fertilizer um, for like uh, roses usually has their own specific rose fertilizer you could buy. For most other plants, it's just general fertilizer. It's always important to read what the bag says because depending on what you use, whether you're using a liquid or a granular or something else you sprinkle on, it will tell you on that fertilizer how much to apply and how frequently to apply it. So it varies depending on what you get. Um, 
more isn't better. You can end up with, someone mentioned brown edges on the leaves. That could be from fertilizer burn too. If you're putting too much fertilizer on the plant and it's not an organic fertilizer, it's a chemical fertilizer that can burn the edges of the leaves or cause um, also tip burn. Tip burn, yes. Or in your house plant, sometimes just the tips of the leaves will be brown. And that could be caused um, from overwatering as well. So we have pretty hard water here too, so some of, if you have plants in pots, it's important to flush them once in a while or water them a whole lot so you see water running up the bottom to the hole, and that'll flush out some of those excess salts in the soil. Okay. Now, um, just a reminder for everybody, so we are going to be going through these questions again. I have been uh, keeping, uh, saving them away, so um, we'll make sure to address these and get answers to everybody again. Let's see. Here's the one that just came in. Now, there's some good questions coming in. Um, there are some white cotton like thing on my lychee tree leaves, front and back of the leaves. There are pest seeds in it. What is this pest? Uh, I can't tell without looking at it, but it could be a uh, uh, scale insect, cottony cushion scale. Um, and what you can do, you could scrape it off if you can, if there's a whole lot. Uh, see how sticky it is? Take a picture and send it into our hotline. Uh, as close up and sharp a picture as you can get. And some of those, uh, I've had cottony cushion scale on uh, sage before, on the twiggy stuff. Um, I just scraped a whole lot off the parts that had too much on. I just had to cut the branch off and dispose of it. Okay. That was a pretty small um, plant. I see a question about loamy soil. Yes. Loamy soil is made up of um, ideal soil should be 25% uh, moisture, 25% air, 45% minerals, and 5% organics. And the loamy soil has, and it's also that mineral part is made up of uh, sand, clay, and um, silt. And a loamy soil has equal parts of all that. A sandy soil, sand is the biggest granules. And if you have a sandy soil, it has a lot of those big granules. That means there's a lot of airspace. Water runs right through it, and it, um, the, it doesn't hold much moisture. The opposite is clay soil. Clay has really tiny particles. There's not much space in between. Uh, so water doesn't run through it very well. It holds on to that water. The advantage of clay soil, it has lots of minerals in it. So a loamy soil is a blend between those three different particle sizes. It has just the right amount of water flow through. It has some clay in it that holds the minerals and will hold some moisture, but not too much moisture. You'll find really good soil um, near where riverbeds are. So if you live right along the Santa Ana River, you probably have some pretty nice soil there because it was the soil that washed out from the river. Are parts of Irvine that have really nice soil that was alluvial soil that ran down from the hills and settled down there in the flatlands. Where with South Coast Rec is we have beautiful soil there, not clay. A lot of us who live in um, planned communities where soil was moved around by bulldozers a lot might have clay soil. And the best way to um, help with clay soil is by adding organic materials. So we've got... There, there are maps you can look up on. If you send a question to our hotline, too, I know there's a place you could look up online where it has um, people have studied soils, and it'll show you what type of soil is in what part. Uh, you have maps, like, of everywhere. And you can find a map of Orange County. It'll show you where there's more clay soil and where there's more loamy soil. And, uh, have a whole diagram. And that's another reason why we raise vegetables and raise beds sometimes, because we could... Put some nice, soft, wonderful soil on top of our old hard clay soil and not worry about what's underneath. Yeah. Vegetable roots are only like go 10 inches in the ground, so it's easy enough to do. Okay, Linda, so um, let's let's answer one more question. Um, and then um, I'm going to just hop on. You guys can see the website is up. I'm just going to go through a couple of these pages um, that okay. Linda couldn't get to. And then we'll be finalizing the presentation. And like I said, it, uh, please go ahead and keep submitting those questions. If more pop into your mind um, before you break off and we'll be answering them hopefully um, as soon as possible. Let's see. So um, any tips for rodents 
out of well out of vegetable beds. I have a problem with them eating my cauliflower and broccoli. That's uh, same thing as uh, when I mentioned before, either um, traps and we have in our um, if you go to the IPM website, they have a whole pest note on rodents and how to uh, keep them from coming. We can't eliminate them completely because they are in the environment. But how to put the traps out, where to set them. You put the traps out first without any, you don't set them or put bait on them just so the rats get used to having them in the environment. Then after that, you set them and bait them. And uh, the snap traps are actually the most humane because they do kill the animal instantly. It doesn't suffer for a long time. Uh, we don't recommend the um, poison baits because the animal goes off and dies somewhere else and then it becomes part of the food chain and something else eats it and that poison uh, travels up. Uh, good way is protection. You know, if you put a uh, screen in your garden, if you live in a place, if you, especially if you're close to an open space area, um, wildlands or anything, you'll have a lot more creatures coming in, whether it's uh, rats or raccoons or possums or anything. Uh, just a wire screening around your garden is usually the best way to keep them out and make sure there's no little holes. Uh, and also they climb up, so you have to have the top on it too. Yeah. Okay, everybody, um, once again, thank you for joining us. Just really quick, we're gonna go through these websites. Um, so people are asking about the, um, the hotline and where can submit questions. Um, so here's the UCC Master Gardeners website of Orange County. Uh, we're going to be also placing a link to all these sites you know, in the email when we send out an email to all the participants. Um, if you have gardening questions, of course, you just click right here. Gardening questions to us, it takes you right over to the hotline page. And um, here's the hotline page where you can fill out the forms, send an email to. There is an email address there as well. Yeah. Um, the form, uh, unfortunately, we can have pictures attached to our form because it goes through their UC system and they don't, they're like, a, you know, very careful about viruses, so we can't attach pictures. But if you email us directly to that really long email, if you scroll up a little bit, Juan, yeah. um, you could be able to see our email address. There it is, right it's, there. It's uh, this really long one here, UCC EOCMG hotline. You can attach pictures to that one. That really helps a lot if you can see the what you're talking about. Sometimes people have simple questions that you know doesn't require a picture, but uh, so if you have a pest or disease, it's really helpful to see the photos. Okay, let's see. Um, and here is the IPM website. So it's ipm.ucanr.edu. Once again, I'm going to be placing these um, links and the email response. And like Linda was saying, this great information on here on uh, yeah. integrated pest management you know that one with the pink the tree with the pink flowers that's what yes. you would click on to uh get you to your home and garden and then from you go on from there uh pests in garden and landscape you can click on whether it's a flower or fruit tree lawns and then it'll branch off from there and then you'll eventually get to a pest note which tells you not it tells you also about the pest it will um, tell you its life cycle, but and also will give you step by step what you can do about it, starting with what's least harmful to the environment and to bringing out the heavy guns if you need to do something. Like that. Or it might tell you that the pest really isn't that bad and you don't have to worry about it. Like the leaf miner, we usually don't do too much about them because the damage is only cosmetic and it doesn't affect the fruit. Yeah. Okay. And somebody did ask on that maybe that the joined us uh, that was out of the area. Mm -hmm. uh, master gardeners um, uh, chapters they're all over california just yep, um, there should be in, um, yeah. one in every county a couple counties are combined but um and they're through the united states too not just california and yes. uh, so if you move somewhere else or you can find master gardeners in north carolina or um, we're associated with land grant university so each master gardener program is attached to a school that has a horticulture or agriculture program. Okay. Awesome. Okay. And let's see. So that's that one. And of course, so these are some some the main websites to look at. And uh, just really quick, this is our rightscapenow.com website for IRWD. For future events, you can click on here and then go to events and classes. <clears throat> 
throughout the year we have classes monthly. Um, we just updated our website with some new classes that we have coming on. So here is the workshop that you went to today that you attended today. The turf be gone workshop is next month. I'm going to be teaching that myself. And also we have a don't spring a leak workshop where we're going to get into um, uh, talks about uh, indoor and outdoor water savings and leaks and overall management, which is going to be a pretty great event. Um, so every month we do have workshops and uh, we have a great relationship with the master gardeners throughout the year. We also have uh, various workshops with them that we that we host here on our website. I think that we're trying to do an edible gardening workshop, Linda. So be on the lookout from from everybody. I think that's one of our most popular ones. And then in the summer, we always have our big composting event that Greg uh, does for us, which is great. So um, just hopefully uh, we'll be able to get out to South Coast oh, yes. again that once we all get fun. vaccinated. That's it. Get back there and, and do some hands on training. And that's where it really, you know, it's, that, that's why I really love the UCNR Center. I mean, what a great facility and to be able to do hands on exercises there is just it's fabulous. And once again, you know, you get. You get these great master gardeners, you know, you know, numerous there, and you know, be able to answer questions back and forth. I mean, what a great opportunity! So hopefully that'll be coming up um, in the future again, and our landscape expo that that goes on. So uh, be on the lookout for all those events. Um, for if you are in our service area, any kind of rebate information that you would need is here on this web page, where you can click on residential rebates. Uh, we have a gardening newsletter, just a lot of information. Um, also, two links to past workshops that we've had. Uh, you can go on here on past classes because people are asking about the webinars. And I am in talks with Master Gardeners on hopefully getting some workshops posted on here as well that that you have done. So here are past workshops that we have put on, and they're all recorded. If you have time, come take a look at them. Uh, controller, controller. Uh, this one, this start, uh, the new year starts now. It's all about, you know, you know, spring into gardening, uh, watershed health. This is an ocean minded landscaping, really talking about uh, watershed wise landscaping, um, California friendly plant like a local, looking at, at uh, California native plants and non native species that'll do great in our beautiful Mediterranean climate and our sprinkler spruce up workshop that we have. So, um, so there are some workshops here to take a look at. Um, I'm going to pop this up really quick here. Um, I did go over this, so we do have our rebates page, rightscapenow.com. Um, we have our rightscaperesources.com website. So this is a gardening website where you can go and uh, do plant data searches, uh, plant database searches. Uh, be very specific on plant material that you're looking for. Also some great gardening tips on here. It's rightscaperesources.com. Um, of course, our events coming up, but uh, that is me right there. If you have any questions, um, feel free to shoot me an email at askwan at irwd.com. I'll be more than happy to try to answer your questions. And if not, if I don't have the answers for you, I have my buddies at the Master Gardens over there that I can always um, try to get some answers from them. And you know, like I said, they're very <laughs> responsive, right, Linda? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And um, so once again, I'd like to thank Linda. I mean, what a great presentation, Linda. You know, we really love having this um, and it's 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 great to have it once again in the beginning of the year just to kind of uh, get us going, you know, because winter is a perfect time to start planning uh, planning. Also, mm -hmm. it's a great time to start getting your natives into the ground. If you're yep. if you uh, love native gardening, it's pretty remember. dry this year. So uh, it's, yeah, it's, it is a dry winter. Yeah, it's a good time to start thinking more about native plants and low water use plants. Exactly. You know, we have a, a vast variety. When we talk about native plants, you guys remember not sticks and cactuses, even though we there are some uh, some succulents and cacti. We're talking about. I mean, you can have a beautiful evergreen garden. Um, a garden that changes year round that requires little to minimal water. I mean, just uh, we have a great array of plants. We have great partnerships with the California Native Plant Society as well, uh, where they have a, the cowscape.org website where you can do plant searches there. And it's also, an excellent, oh, excellent website. It's fantastic. Cowscape, yeah, it's great. You can look up your zip code and find out what native plants uh, will do best in your area. Exactly, and then they have a great nurseries uh, search, so you can so you know which nurseries are carrying those plants. 
Uh, but once again, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, hopefully we'll have you here in the future. Linda, thank you again. Master Gardeners, you know, you guys are always great and um, we'll be uh, responding to everybody's questions. And once again, thank you for your time and we look forward to having you in the future for other workshops. Thanks, Juan. If you can stay on, Linda, that'll be great. Yeah. So, yeah. I have a couple questions. Okay. Thank you, everybody.